A warm welcome to this UI webinar, where we hope to shed some light on the India-China border conflict and its local and regional implications. The webinar is broadcasted on Facebook and will be posted later uh, on the UI website. My name is Henrik Kjetan Aspengren. I'm a research fellow with the Asia program. Since 2020, the focus in the border dispute between India and China has been on hostilities in the Western sector of the India-China border area around the line of actual control in Ladakh. Actual fist fighting through, uh, leading to the death of, of soldiers, infrastructure buildups and increased in personnel has escalated the conflict. There have been 15 rounds of talks between military commanders uh, on the ground and several meetings on senior diplomatic level through the working mechanism for consultation and coordination on India-China border affairs in order to de-escalate the situation. But we must also recall the large-scale military standoff uh, between India and China in Doklam in 2017, some 2,500 kilometers from the western sector in Ladakh. This shows that the borderlands across the Himalayas um, could be subject to conflict between Asia's two giants. From a wider foreign policy perspective, it is clear that the border conflict affects other dimensions of the bilateral relationship between India and China. This is something that China, in rhetoric at least, suggests should change. In connection to his visit in Delhi on the 25th of March, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a disturbing backdrop, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi said that the border issue should neither define or, nor affect the overall development of the India-China ties. India's Minister for External Affairs, Subramanian Jaishankar, viewed it differently. Jaishankar said that, and I quote, the frictions and tensions that arise from China's deployment since April 2020 cannot be reconciled with the normal relationship between two neighbors. In an answer to a um, direct question from an Indian journalist, he said, and I quote again, if you ask me, is our relationship normal today? My answer to you is no, it is not, and it cannot be normal if the situation in the border areas is abnormal, end of quote. But the urgent security concerns emanating from the border conflict sometimes ob obscure the fact that the Himalayan region is a lived environment where people have been connected through kinship, uh, trade and shared faith for centuries. So another question we hope to discuss today is how the militarization and securitization of the region affects everyday life uh, and people-to-people -people contacts. This is not simply an anthropological add-on. As one of our speakers today wrote recently for Times of India, from an Indian perspective, sensitivity to local needs and efforts to humanize borders will be necessary when facing external challenges to borderlands. Now, today we have a great panel to discuss all of this, and I'll introduce them in order of appearance. First out is Oskar Almian, senior analyst at the Swedish Defense Research Agency. We've asked Oskar to discuss whether he sees changes to Beijing's approach to the border conflict since Doklam in 2017, and then uh, through Galvan um, in 2020, and, and now today. We also asked him to comment on whether China's views on the border dispute with India differ from other territorial disputes uh, where China is involved. We will then um, have Shruti Pandalai, who will speak next. Shruti is an associate fellow at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in Delhi. The views that she will convey here are her own and do not necessarily reflect the views of her institute. Shruti will tell us about factors that have been driving Delhi's more resolute stand 
um, on the border conflict in the last couple of years. She will also discuss the broader regional um, issues at stake for Delhi. Lisa Shang will follow. Lisa is a PhD candidate at the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies at Heidelberg University. Lisa has been studying the Himalayan region and will tell us about how the current situation, um, uh, if at all, affect everyday life in the Himalayas. The panel will be followed by a Q&A with you, the audience. So please submit your questions in the Q&A function in Zoom or via Facebook, and I'll try to fold your questions into our conversation. So without further ado, um, I give the mic to Oscar, please. The mic is yours. Well, thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, so I will start with the questions that you were raising, and I'll, of course, then speak from, from uh, uh, the Chinese standpoint of this conflict, since I've been focusing on China and Chinese politics for a long time. Uh, so starting then in, in 2017 at the Doklam standoff, uh, this was uh, created a very strong reaction from the Chinese side. Uh, just to, to reiterate then, uh, the, the Doklam standoff started with the Chinese side building a road into a territory that is claimed by Bhutan. And uh, the, China, uh, the Indian side reacted by uh, moving troops into Bhutan and, and uh, you know, trying to stop this uh, road building pro uh, project. And this led to a standoff for 30, uh, 73 days. And finally, the, the, the Chinese side backed off and, and stopped uh, the building. Uh, but from the Chinese uh, PLA side, they, they, they noticed that this uh, was a tactical disadvantage from, from the Chinese side. And, and they decided then to, to improve the, the infrastructure along the line of action control. Uh, and uh, between 2017 and 2020, they actually doubled the number of of military installments, uh, such as uh, heli, uh, heli platforms and, and airfields and, and things like that along the line of actual control. So, so that resulted in a, in a quite dramatic change in terms of, of uh, infrastructure build up along the border. Um, uh, and uh, in a way, you can also say that the, that standoff became a, a bit of a turning point in relationship uh, from a more friendly relationship to a more confrontational relationship. Um, I should say also that uh, this can also be related to the leadership. I'm not going to talk a lot about Moody, of course. The, 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 the Indian side will, uh, can explain that. Uh, but from a Chinese perspective, uh, they see Moody as, as being a very nationalist uh, leader and, and uh, that it has that is pursuing a much more assertive uh, policy from, from the Indian side. But of course, uh, from the Chinese side, we have Xi Jinping. And at this time in 2017, he, he was really started to pursue a more assertive foreign policy, not only in terms of in, in relation to India, but, but generally. Uh, and, and he was changing the discourse of, of what China's role in the world should be. So you can also connect it to, to Xi Jinping's important uh, uh, position at this time. Uh, then uh, this uh, further developed uh, and, and uh, kind of peaked, uh, not only of course China built this infrastructure along the line of uh, actual control, but also the Indian side. Uh, and by April, May uh, in 2020 then, uh, the Chinese side had, had moved, uh, deployed troops uh, to areas where the Indian side found, uh, argued that it was the Indian side of line of actual control, uh, which led to confrontations. And eventually then this led to the clashes in, in June 15, 2020, where as we heard already previously, uh, a lot of soldiers were, uh, were killed. And the Chinese side has only claimed uh, four casualties so far but this question this this number is questioned by figures from the China, from the indian side who, who claim that the, the chinese casualties were far more than that now of course after that uh, deadly clash which was the the, the, the deadliest clash since 1967 i believe uh, and uh, 
this, this created a very strong reaction from, from both sides. Uh, and we now have 50 to 60,000 troops on, on either side of, of the uh, line of actual control. So this led to a quite dramatic situation. Now, by February 2021, then, the, the, there started a de-escalation uh, from some of the points along the line of actual control where the troops were fighting uh, or were facing each other. Uh, and now I believe there's only one spot left where they, they still haven't uh, disengaged. Uh, but the, obviously the, the, the relationship is still very tense in, in many dimensions. Uh, I'll stop there with that question and, and move over to the other question that you were raising about the similarities with, with, with Chinese behavior in other parts. Then it's difficult. I mean, when it comes to land borders, the only land border that China has a conflict with, except for India, is Bhutan. Uh, but you can draw parallels with the um, uh, maritime conflict that China has with, with other countries, such as, um, and especially then the South China Sea, where, where China is in conflict with several other countries about that area. Now, China has been accused of using a so-called salami slicing strategy piece by piece taking uh, initiatives like building infrastructure. In the case of South China Sea, then China has built a lot of uh, artificial islands and military installments on those islands to uh, improve their position. Now, the same tactics seem to have been used here in, 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 in relation to, to the uh, border with India and that conflict, where there's a lot of uh, uh, infrastructure buildings and also building of new villages in the Tibetan area on the China side in order to change the, uh, the, the facts on the ground. So yes, it can definitely be, be similarities seen between these different uh, regions, uh, different border conflicts. I think I'll stop there and, uh, for the moment. Thank you so much, uh, Oscar. Um, can, I, can I just ask you um, about this recent, your take uh, on this recent trip by the Chinese foreign minister to South Asia. It was a whistle stop tour um, and not really pre-announced and a little secretive. And there were some controversial statements made, made uh, from, uh, from an Indian perspective made by uh, the foreign minister in, uh, when he visited Islamabad and then some more reconciling whatever um, uh, uh, tones when he visited Delhi. So what can we make of this, of this um, uh, recent diplomatic exercise? Yeah, I think uh, we have to look at this from a perspective of, of, of the global geopolitics uh, at the moment. Uh, now, uh, China is really concerned about the, the relationship between the United States and India, that it has be become closer and closer. And they also see this as the reason why India is becoming more assertive because they have the, the, the United States backing. Uh, and uh, a way to deal with that is to, to try to improve the relationship with either India or the United States in order to, to you know, push a wedge between those uh, because uh, the, the fight against China is, is what China considers to be what unites them. So I think the trip that Wang Yi made to, to, uh, to the foreign minister of China, then Wang Yi made to, to uh, New Delhi, uh, had the focus to try to improve the relationship with, with, with India. And because it was also talking about how they share similar views in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. They, they have strong relations, friendly relations with, with Russia. And they, they were trying to, you know, argue that, that, that China and India should speak with the same voice in, in that conflict. And that would be, I, I see that as a way to, to try to connect with India, not only in this question, but also related to, to the border conflict, to, to strengthen the relationship in, or, in order to maybe move India away from the Western side of the conflict. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure there will be more questions about this perhaps later from the audience. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Oscar. I'll, um, we'll, let's move to you now, Shruti, in Delhi. Um, uh, so um, uh, we look forward to hear your points now. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Henrik. And uh, let me just begin by saying thank you for inviting me uh, to this panel, which has some very great speakers. I think you and Oscar have already done a great job uh, of providing a rationale, uh, you know, and setting the stage for Chinese action. But, you know, let me be blunt here uh, and say this today that, you know, when there is an emerging consensus internationally to unite efforts in blunting Chinese unilateralism and putting a cost to its uh, misbehavior, it's an open secret that India has been living with these uh, you know, truth since the 1950s, Chinese, pro, you know, patterns of provocation have endured for over five decades and efforts at palliation or mitigating tensions without curing the root of the problem have also endured and remained very cosmetic. What has changed really is that the bloody clash from Ganwan came at a time uh, when I think the global town hall had begun to feel the heat of what India has been on the receiving end for years and thus there's been a discernible shift and to some extent more empathy and I think understanding on India's position uh, you know and how vis-a-vis -vis China. Now uh, you know to come to specifics of what you asked me to reflect upon uh, you know and India's position and response after Galmali incident. Uh, first I think the word inflection point has been used to describe the crossroads at you know, where India and China fight themselves at the moment. And our foreign minister, Dr. Jayashankar, has often made this point that the issue isn't simply about, um, you know, one of Sino-Indian competition or rivalry. The issue is really on how does India manage a relationship if the basis of the relationship has been violated by one side. So India has, of course, consistently used the term premeditated action by China, even as China blames India for infrastructure buildup along the line of control for triggering the crisis. As facts stand on the ground from our side, the, you know, the cause of the standoff was the Chinese PLA taking action uh, to change the status quo at the LSA unilaterally. We are aware that the PLA acted at multiple points, like you also mentioned, and created, in fact, presence, according to us, in areas which they didn't claim earlier, and even moved into areas that are claimed by both sides, that too in large numbers, which went against past protocols and agreements that were already in place. They were also apparently hindering Indian patrols where they normally, uh, you know, were used to patrol. Uh, so what has happened since then, uh, you know, they continues to mass military hardware structures and troops post Galwan. And we've seen a situation, like I said, where the entire line of patrol control has come alive. Now, despite commentary rates on the contrary, you know, and I've said about the patterns of provocation on our border and escalation at Galwan really didn't come as a surprise to many strategists and planners in New Delhi, um, because we've been seeing a high level of belligerence coming from the PLA. Uh, you have a lot of military practitioners who've gone on record to say uh, that, uh, you know, these face-offs for nearly a decade have transcended to a higher plane. And uh, all of this does not lead to, you know, you know we've seen this uh, lead to disengagement for a very, not uh, in certain places, not for a long time. India has undertaken intense border standoffs in 2013 in Dalat Beg, in Chumar, in Dem Chok in 2014. And more seriously, you know, we've seen standoffs, uh, say in Doklam in 2017, which only reaffirmed sort of Indian attitudes of Chinese intention. Uh, India was already concerned about the rapid infrastructure buildup in Tibet and the upgrade of feeder roads to border areas, allowing Ch Chinese troops to amass more quickly. Uh, and we also saw that in the absence of any progress or negotiations, perceptions on the Indian side were firm that India's infrastructure and military disadvantages uh, were being used to amass territorial gains in the border areas where Indian patrolling was minimal or in fact non-existent. So, you know, to say that, you know, this comes as a surprise is not really true. We've seen patterns of provocation. Um, and we also, I think many ways, military planners say they anticipated a reaction uh, in terms of what the Chinese side would do in, if we built up our infrastructure. And we've seen that a lot in the writing as well. The, you know, a lot of the writing constantly increases alarm over Indian military upgrades, uh, but there's also tinged with the dismissal of poor quality and slow pace. So we see this uh, sort of anxiety playing out, yet you see, uh, you know, there's an urgency in upgrading Chinese capabilities and resources, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Western Theater Command. And there is more attention towards the border with India, especially with the reorganization of military regions. Uh, so in short, the tragedy um, 
you know, an escalation was not definite, yet it was certainly plausible given the patterns of provocation over the last decade. Uh, and it perhaps goes on to exemplify that even though, the, you know, in the broader context of Sino-US, Sino-Indian relations, we dispel issues of zero-sum game rivalries. The fact is that no amount of outreach really has been able to overcome the perception that actions by one player automatically are perceived as disregard for the other's entitlement and aspirations. Now, to quickly come to where uh, we are at right now, you mentioned uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit in New Delhi. Now, uh, you know, India has repeated that the relationship cannot go back to business as usual unless the border situation is resolved, while China did not suggest any new means to, you know, break the long jam either. China has constantly asked for a delinking of the border problem uh, from the larger relationship and keeping it at appropriate place. What in practice uh, is that we have a live LAC and the framing of the debate as one of a sovereignty issue um, by China and not a boundary dispute. And this distinction is important because, uh, you know, a boundary dispute can be resolved by give and take. But so China has really uh, conveyed its intent because it makes it harder to settle, it also you know, suggests that China uh, is looking at the issue to, dra to drag on in terms of a political settlement, because you know, Beijing from the Indian point of view does not want to lose leverage, but at the same time, this reinforces the insecurity dynamic in the bilateral relationship. Because from the Chinese perspective, sitting in India, uh, many would argue that the resolution of the boundary dispute will have to wait until sort of a broader geopolitical alignment is in its favor. As for the mechanisms in place, I mean, what Galvan did is tear up what has been built upon incrementally since 1993. So we find ourselves in, you know, absolutely a new normal to start negotiations from the scratch. But like you mentioned, we've seen 50 rounds of, 15 rounds of border commander talks, eight sort of rounds of meetings between special working mechanisms for consultation and coordination on the India-China border. Uh, nothing has changed in terms of friction areas, including at Petrol Point 15, Demchok and Depsang, where troops have been amassed on both sides. Uh, now, Beijing has suggested a three-point formula, like you mentioned, where it says that, you know, we have civilizational ties and, you know, we need a win-win situation and we need to co cooperate in the multilateral sphere, whether it is the BRICS 2020 Two, or when it's India's turn to host the SCO and the G20. Uh, but the fact remains is India has also not really moved from what it's saying. That And the fact that three mutuals of mutual respect, sensitivity, and interest uh, remain the de determining factors in this relationship. And any expectation that, can be, that they can be brushed aside uh, will not happen. So, uh, and it's not realist realistic. So I think the fact remains that the needle has really not shifted despite the optics that perhaps this visit aimed to achieve in the broader way that Chinese narrative works uh, both for the external and the domestic audience. Uh, now, what has, you know, in the end, uh, I want to talk about what implications does it have in terms of the current state of play in India's larger strategic calculus. What Chinese actions have really done is triggered a rethinking in India on its China policy and done what is perhaps even was even more difficult in the past, which is bring India and the United States together, especially on managing uh, the rise of China. Today, you see uh, India, whose economic relationship with China was very dependent, is taking steps to initiate the rewiring of global supply chains, maintaining access for global commons, keeping in check tech nationalism. Of course, you see groupings like the Indo-Pacific theater becoming so important with the Quad, Quad Plus, and many other two plus two dialogue mechanisms coming into place. Uh, so this push for a coalition of the willing, if you will, uh, against Chinese bullying would not have happened at the scale and speed that it has in the absence of Galwan. And India's decision to cross sort of political and economic red lines has clearly not gone unnoticed uh, by China. We've seen moves uh, at cup keeping, you know, China out at the construction of India's 5G infrastructure, a lot of bans and repeated at that on Chinese apps. You have a lot of stricter screening in terms of Chinese investment in critical sectors. Um, while, you know, India's diversification of its great power relationships and issue based coalitions in the Indo-Pacific, um, and we've also seen that all of this is happening uh, when Delhi has maintained a sustained military and political dialogue with Beijing while buffering up its borders. 
as also uh, mirroring or countering Chinese military, military deployments on the ground. Uh, so as Doklam proved in the past that, you know, China's forays into South Asia, including in adventurism in the Indian Ocean region, all the disputed borders are generally aimed at imposing reputational costs on India. So as a result, China will be more inclined to manipulate uh, from the Indian point of view, uh, the game to improve its strategic payoff vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Now, this is problematic because, you know, the Beijing's framing of the Sino-Indian relationship increase, increasingly through the lens of Sino-US fallout, uh, you know, troubles India because it, you know, it seems that all the work done in the bilateral relationship so long has been thrown out of the window. So given the above, you know, despite high profile meetings and so on and so forth, anxiety remains. And I think these tensions will continue to effort, affect the larger politics in the region. I'll stop here and thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, great, Shruti. Uh, thank you for your insights. So let me just ask you what, a question. Perhaps you can reiterate or develop a bit more, but... Um, since you mentioned that there, from the Indian perspective, have been ongoing provocations um, for, for a very long time, uh, but things have really changed after 2017 and 2020. Was it the, the nature of the provocations from an Indian perspective, or was it that India was in a position to, to sort of risk, to find a more resolute response um, to, to what they saw as Chinese provocations? I think there are two, the way to answer your question is, uh, you know, both domestic factors and external factors. Domestically, India has been incrementally trying to develop its ability, buffer its capacity to meet the China challenge. Externally, uh, as the consensus on China emerges in the, uh, you know, global conversation, India was able to leverage its great power relationships to buffer its own capacities to manage the China challenge. So I think both work together in India's favor to develop a more resolute response. But the fact remains that 2020 told us that, you know, uh, the question of reciprocity was not mutual anymore in the India-China relationship. In the past, what we've seen is India has often deferred to Chinese red lines on what they thought were their sensitivities. And there was an expectation of Chinese reciprocity. But that never happened on many of the issues that we are concerned about, whether it's cross-border terrorism uh, and uh, or the, uh, our situation on the border dispute. So uh, I think that overall, both the external and domestic factors came together and we were able to, you know, I think that contributed to India's decision making. Thank you. Thank you. We will have, uh, uh, we'll be um, coming back to, to you uh, in the Q&A session and there will be I'm sure a lot of questions. Um, uh, thank you so much. Let's now move on to, to Lisa. Um, and um, um, you will discuss um, the, the sort of lived reality in the Himalayan region, uh, which you have been studying and, and writing about. So Lisa, uh, please, the floor is yours. First, I want to say I'm delighted to be participating in this panel with Oscar and Shruti, and thanks, Henrik, for inviting me. Um, I think when we talk about the local population along the line of actual control, we tend to think in a top-down way. That is how the current situation between Beijing and Delhi affects everyday life among the people in the Himalayan borderlands. While this naturally remains an important question. I believe something that often disappears in this picture is the opposite and equally important question. How does everyday life in the borderlands affect the current India-China situation? From the centers of power such as Delhi and Beijing, the Himalayan borderlands may seem like the edge of the sovereign territory of being places on the periphery. But from the perspective of the borderlands, it is the borderlands that are at the center and Beijing and Delhi that are at the periphery. Furthermore, I think because of the nature of the borderlands are to be at the edge, that is defining of sovereign territory, conflicts in the so-called peripheries of power often end up cutting across right through the traditional centers of power. Now, 
The drawing of the Sino-Indian border is the marking of the respective countries' territoriality. And as many scholars have pointed out, when it comes to the implementation of the Sino-Indian border, or any border for that matter, it can never be only a question of slicing up land cartographically. The issue of territoriality in the Sino-Indian borderlands requires, amongst other things, also the winning over of the local population who live in these areas. Not only is aid or at least non-interference of the local population crucial for the militarization of these treacherous mountainous and desert regions, it is also vital for a number of other reasons, such as the acquiring of local geographical knowledge, provision of labor, espionage, and trade. So since the 1950s, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of India have worked consistently to develop the border regions and accommodate the people there in a bid to win them over to their respective sides. Take the example of the eastern sector of the border, Arunachal Pradesh. Arunachal Pradesh has historically been part of what the anthropologist William Van Schendel has called Zumia, an area which does not fit neatly into nation states categories and covers the Southeast Asian massive. This is also an area which another scholar, James Scott has argued, is characterized by statelessness. Arunachal Pradesh, so in this Zomia function, was at the frontier of two empires, the British and the Qing empires, where the imperial reach did not really stretch. So when the British, when British India became Republic of India in 1947, and the Qing Empire became the Republic of China and later People's Republic of China in 1949, these two nation states inherited these fuzzy borderlands from the former empires. And it is important to note that these empires did not operate with the idea of hard borders, but implemented something which we can call more of a frontier policy towards its borderlands. This is in contrast to a cohesive and territorial foreign policy that we are more used to today. So one of the core projects of incorporating the borderlands into the fold of the state in the 1950s was to nationalize the borderland people who had hitherto been independent and lived separately from states. In colonial times, when it came to the shared borderlands between Qing China, Tibet, and British India, British India expressed wariness of China and vice versa in their shared borderlands. However, from the time the PRC and the ROI became established, an even more powerful and intricate game of what Bernice Goyot Richard has called shadowing began. In the incorporation of borderland people into the Chinese and Indian states, the two states perceived the borderland people as potential aids and threats who could choose and defect to the other side if it suited them. In this sense, India became China's shadow state and China became India's shadow state as the idea of the other state lurked in each state's imagination. Which side would the borderland people choose? In the 1950s, the Indian state, as it began to incorporate NEFA, now Arunachal Pradesh, and the Chinese state began the so-called peaceful liberation of Tibet, both states initiated several developmental projects and put money into the borderland regions to raise the living standards of the local population. Not only was this because the two states wanted to militarize and concretize the border, but also because the two states wanted to gain the loyalty and cooperation of their borderland people. These developmental efforts on both sides of the border did, as could be, be imagined intensify after the 1962 war. Until this day, my colleague Mizra Rahman tells me some of the Adi and Mishimi tribes in Arunachal Pradesh played the so-called China card. So despite harboring Indian nationalist sentiments fostered in large part by Hindi schools in the region, these tribes know they can always move to the other side if the Indian state does not meet their conditions and demands. In this sense, low politics affect high politics and vice versa. And there is a dialectic between the two. 
So these are the admission is communities have the ability to negotiate the border tensions to their advantages at times. They are aware of that the infrastructure projects and road building that connects their villages to greater India are not necessarily there for their own development, but are part of a larger project in order to keep them loyal and useful to the Indian states in view of the threat of China. And they funnily enough call these roads China Grace Roads. What is important to keep in mind, I think, when we talk about the borderland people along Lac is that there is no such thing as a homogenous borderland along the line of actual control. These are hetero heterogeneous communities and they act differently to the China-Indian situation. So the Galwan skirmish in 2020 may have had a great impact on the local population in the bordering areas in Aksai Chin and changed the ethnic demography as the Indian side brought in 12,000 workers to work on the Indian infrastructure projects there. But to borderland people in Arunachal Pradesh, Aksai Chin is very far away. Rather, what may arouse Indian national sentiment in particular would be, for example, if the Chinese side detained some Adis from the Indian side or vice versa, and this might arouse nationalist sentiment. So for example, the Indian boycott China campaign after the Galwan skirmish, Galwan Valley skirmish, hardly had any effect on the Arunachal Pradesh borderland population. So this is one case of nationalist sentiments in the Adi and Mishimi communities in Arunachal Pradesh. Another anthropologist's colleague of mine, Abhimanyu Pandey, told me that another source of nationalist sentiments in the border town Spiti in Himachal Pradesh is due to a developed and improved media infrastructure in the town. Because media such as mobile networks, television, and newspapers have become readily available now in Spiti, it has made the town lean more towards the BJP and become more nationalistic although it historically tended to vote Congress. Compare this to the Adi and Mishimi communities in Arunachal Pradesh that have only recently connected to mobile network. So there's a stark contrast in how these things are developed along the border. So again, I would like to stress that there is no homogeneity among the communities along the line of actual control. So this, for example, equally applies to trade across the border. Trade has, of course, historically been important to the borderland regions for centuries. After the 1962 war, large-scale border trade, trade came to a halt altogether. So Spiti, for example, used to experience a substantial Indo-Tibetan border trade or trade before the border, before the 1962 war. But today, there are no remains of that cross-border trade. However, South of Spiti lies the Shipkila mountain pass where there has been legal border trade since the 1990s. And so it shows that really your geographical position does determine a lot if you can have contact with the other side and if you can conduct trade and so forth. Um, but since 2020, the border trade has also stopped along this few mountain passes that were opened between China and India. And this was not because of China-India skirmishes, but because of the COVID pandemic. So during the pandemic, China required anyone who crossed its borders to quarantine for at least two weeks. This also applied to traders on the Indian side who were engaging in cross-border trade and as a result, cross-border trade became quite untenable. So Shipkila remains closed to this day. Um, and my own research has looked into how cross-border trade came to a complete halt after the 1962 war in the border town Kalimpong located close to Sikkim. So Kalimpong used to be the biggest conduit for Tibetan and Indian trade before the war, but after the war trade more or less came to a halt. And there are some traders who found alternative routes, such as through Nepal and Natula, which is close to Kalimpong, has also been opened. But there, this is very local and small trade. So you don't see these big caravans coming back and forth anymore. But on the other hand, there is another kind of trade in, for example, Arunachal Pradesh, 
where there are no fenced borders between China and India. And so the Mishimi from the Chinese and Indian side go hunting together in these forests that they share and they barter with each other. So this is another kind of trade that is still possible. And in this sense, it is still a very porous border. It's not a very hard border. Um, but it is nevertheless impossible for large scale cross border to trade to take place in Arunachal Pradesh since those that kind of large scale trade has to go through mountain passes and those have been closed since 1962 and they're heavily guarded both by the Indian and Chinese side. So the really the point I want to make is a very simple one and that is that low politics affects high politics and each community along the line of actual control will negotiate the China India situation differently. And the two states' policies will just have to adapt to what is actually happening on the ground. And this will just have an impact on the Chinese and Indian states. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, really interesting. Um, uh, let, let me just bring you into conversation before we head into the questions coming from the audience. And I encourage the audience to submit um, your questions in the Q&A. Um, bring you into conversation with Shruti on something that Shruti just published in Times of India about the need for from the Indian side to sort of engage um, the border areas um, and populations there. Um, so uh, there seems to be a, a sort of similar idea here, but um, do you think uh, from your perspective, Lisa, these uh, sort of um, projects to, to sway or vote the, the local populations um, in development projects, have they been successful or are they sort of um, uh, missing their target? Um, I think they have been successful to a great extent, both on the Chinese and Indian side, but for different reasons. And I think it is largely because the propaganda has worked. So. The, on the Chinese side, the Chinese side can clearly feel, for example, in the South Tibetan area or Arunachal Pradesh, that the Chinese side is richer. They have better houses, they get more money, there is more development. On the other hand, the Indian side, they know they have freedom and democracy. And it's also the Indian side knows that there can be more room for negotiation with the Indian state because it's not as strong as the Chinese state. And I think both countries really have realized the importance since the 1950s, there have been consistent efforts to develop these areas in order to win over their own sides. Um, it's really quite amazing to see these big mansions on the Tibet or in the development on the Tibetan side. And yes, I think it has, I think both sides have been pretty successful. And I think one part of why it has been successful is that maybe there hasn't been that much communication between the two different sides in that sense. Thank you. So just briefly, Shruti, um, your latest piece on, on, on the borderlands, um, you, you frame it as um, there is a need sort of to humanize the borders and to further extend um, uh, uh, you know, more efforts to, to sort of um, reach the border communities. So could you tell us a bit more about, develop your thoughts on that, please? Thanks, Hendrik. I think Lisa made some excellent points, uh, but I'm going to just say uh, one thing is that, you know, I, as chaotic as India is and as much sub-nationalism in terms of arguments continue to happen even at the moment, I think when you talk about Arunachal Pradesh, and yes, there are sort of, you know, you're talking about a state which has 26 tribes and you know uh, perhaps 500 or 700 different dialects and yes you know the idu mishimis have their agency and you know the, a lot of that is what she's talking about in terms of local uh, local politics reflecting on high politics in uh, uh, you know in the uh, in the larger scheme, I'm sorry, just a second, I'm at work, there are calls coming in, in the larger sense of the, um, it, the battles with, of low politics affecting high politics, all of this is very real, but I have to say this, you know, I did 
um, a field trip in Arunachal Pradesh. And the, the uh, sentiment there really was one of anger. They were saying that, you know, what India, mainstream India does in terms of, you know, the national media is actually a disservice to the state because what, what we have no intentions of using our agency in terms of, you know, uh, your battle with China. China is not the problem. The problem is the socio-economic development in the state. We don't care about China. We're, we are Indians, and please recognize this. We are as Indian as you, Bengalis are, or as Keralites are. As you know, so this was a this was a palpable conversation uh, among the locals uh, about um, you know, the problems that they are facing. So they said China is the least of our concerns. What our concern really is at the moment is the social economic development where my kids study, you know, our access to schools, colleges, et cetera. Yes, China plays the infrastructure card, but there's clearly a, a reason why uh, we don't buy it to it. And the third factor they said is, you know, this whole question of, uh, you know, cross-border and the claims that Chinese make in terms of South Tibet and how it's lapped up in narratives, even in New Delhi, because there's a lot of uh, lack of awareness is that they constantly say that, yes, there's 11% of the population, which is Buddhist, but the rest of the tribes are, you know, animistic. And this doesn't seem to translate into the larger, broader audience, even in India, because we seem to conflate everything that happens with the Dalai Lama to the whole of the state. And that is seen as hugely problematic. Uh, so my short, short answer to that question is, yes, there are huge uh, problems in that we are trying to catch up in terms of infrastructure and socioeconomic development on our, our borders. However, having said that, that, uh, you know, where does, uh, where does the... I, I'm not really sure about how much agency in terms of uh, the you know locals use in terms of trying to negotiate uh, better that we'll go over to China if the situation doesn't improve in India. I don't think that situation exists at all. I think our national identity is very, very uh, solid. They're very proud of their identity and their tribe, especially their tribal identity and they associate uh, that with India and they say it's a choice they have made and they're very proud of it. So I leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Uh, um, I, I'll ask you a question um, now, Oscar. Um, we'll pick up some questions from the audience. Um, so uh, one question I have is, <clears throat> you know, Shruti mentioned the, the sort of uh, the, the, some of the statements made, uh, uh, and you also mentioned them uh, from the Chinese foreign minister and how they were received in India. So this idea of separating uh, the border conflict from the larger picture of, of China-India uh, relations, um, is that, um, uh, has that been a Chinese position for a long time or has that changed over time? That's one question I would like to ask you. And what are the possibilities? I mean, how sincere are those, um, are those overtures? Um, um, because, uh, some of the comments here in the chat box are, are about the possibility of China and India to actually be become uh, not perhaps allies, but at least uh, cooperate in, to a larger extent that, than they're, they're now doing. So if you would assess this uh, a bit, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, basically the position has, has been uh, has been this for a long time that the China has been, you know, trying to promote the bilateral relations in other dimensions and, and leave the border conflict uh, as much as possible. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, from a Chinese perspective, they, they feel that they are, are, you know, the time is on their side, basically, not only in, 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 in relation to, to the United States and other countries, uh, but I think also in, in, in relation to India, even though India is also in, uh, an emerging power. So I, I think, there's a strategy to uh, the, the more time you know passes the, the China becomes stronger and stronger uh, and this also I mean it's very clear from from the China side that they, they, they there is a strong sense of, of uh, self-confidence and, and the China is worse and I, I think there is a strong belief in this as well uh, that that uh, this is the way it's going um, and I mean in a way it's it's uh, becoming uh, a part, I mean, th this narrative 
is becoming so dominant in China now, and and, and the, the people that are actually trying to question it uh, are are really being marginalized. I mean, uh, you hear uh, scholars who, who complain about this problem that that young students, for example, they they are completely. Uh, uh, unrealistic, and they are so emerged in this idea that China is becoming more and more powerful that that it might be dangerous because they don't realize that you know it's not realistic in a way. Uh, and of course, when you have at the same time uh, more censorship and more uh, less and less pluralism, then this you turn into a, a kind of a, a spiral where, where where there's not much room for for alternative opinions. And I, I mean, we can always draw the parallel to, to the situation now in, in Russia, where, I mean, uh, the image of, of the world kind of becomes, uh, uh, you know, not really correct. Uh, and, and that makes you take uh, uh, very, not very well calculated decisions. And I, there's, there's a risk that you will have a similar situation appearing in, in China and, and the decision making of, of the Chinese leadership. Thank you. Um, I, I'll ask a question now from the audience to, to Lisa first um, about the, you mentioned that, you know, the, the, what you call the low sort of low politics can affect the high politics and uh, one question from the audience is uh, about the depth of of the um, the connections in the region but i would i mean how connected are the different uh, uh, um, are people in the region across uh, the area but i would also ask you whether is this connection that people feel in the border areas or that they have through kinship and other means, is that something that extends outside of the border area? Are there sort of um, groups that have migrated from the border area that have uh, feel familiarity with people who have migrated you know, to, to, main, to other parts of China, for example, or other parts of India, so that the links can be sort of multiplied um, in that way? Um, can you elaborate a little bit on how yeah. the link can be multiplied? Well, the, they... Yes, my question is, since is, is the connectivity felt among people in the border areas? Is that isolated to people in the border areas? Or are there connections also elsewhere in India um, uh, and China uh, emanating from the groups from the border area that have moved uh, within India or moved within China, for example? So that the links are sort of multiplied and expanded. Um, so from what the little I, because I study a particular border town, Kalimpong, so I'm not sure how well it translates into greater border region. Um, so if we look at, for example, trade connectivity. So there used to be Tibetan families, Chinese families, Nepalese families, Indian families who had cross-border trade networks over the whole of the Himalayan region. And that has been completely severed since 1962. So those kind of cross-border region networks do not really exist anymore. Um, on the other hand, if you look at, for example, these missionary communities that go so for example in the in the chinese side the mish no the adis i think they are not allowed to perform certain animalistic animalistic religious rituals as ruta just mentioned <laughs> not everyone is buddhist in these areas so they go actually to the chinese to the indian side these chinese missionaries to the indian side so there is a kinship in that sense because these rituals are allowed on the indian side but I don't think this, I mean, the border region is very sparsely populated and I just don't know how much this would translate into if they moved further away and if they retained this contact, especially to the other side of the border. I find this intuitively quite unlikely, but I wouldn't be sure. Thank you. Um, so um, question for you uh, then, Shruti. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of, um, of keeping the border uh, conflict connected to the wider uh, uh, relationship between India and, uh, and China, that the Indians have 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 
have kept that, uh, I mean, have, have done that for quite a while now, as you say. Um, uh, do you think, is, I mean, is that a cross party or, you know, um, is that sort of idea uh, of keeping those issues connected, is that across parties or is it something that is now very strong within the current uh, ruling party or do you see that also in, in other parties that uh, the Congress, for example? I think Indian foreign policy has been very fairly consistent on China. Uh, but what has changed over a period of time, like I've described, is, uh, you know, this expectation that Beijing will finally come around to see things from the Indian point of view, because the amount of political investment actually both sides have made since 1993 to put confidence building measures in place, you know, have uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, low uh, disputes remain, you know, if something does happen, provocations happen, uh, uh, things are wrapped up locally. Uh, but I, I won't, But what we saw is that, like I've been saying, there is no reciprocity in this sensitivity. And I think uh, now the uh, China question that there is unanimity across uh, you know, party lines on how um, India needs to react. And I think in India being a democracy, what uh, public sentiment does count, even though you, you know I've written a paper on whether public sentiment translates into uh, you know impacting foreign policy agendas in India. However, I do think what Galwan did in 2020 was mainstream the anti-China sentiment in India, and I think any uh, dispensation will now find uh, rolling this back very tough. So if you see uh, even the Wangi presser, uh, you know. Dr. Jayashankar comes out and says that I've conveyed in the national sentiment uh, to my, my Chinese counterpart. Now, these are very telling statements. Uh, so I, I mean, to a short answer to that question is, I think there is a unanimous sort of uh, understanding of where China stands and uh, where India stands on the uh, China relationship and the fact that, you know, we are insisting that there will be no delinking of uh, the border situation with the larger bilateral relationship. I don't think that's rolling back. Thanks. Uh, one more question um, um, from the from the audience. Um, I, I will see how we direct it to. Uh, I'll read out here. Is it likely that China could negotiate with India or with India and US together and back down without losing face? Why does China feel like this is a conflict that is not urgent to address right now? I think I'll direct that to Oscar. Um... Well, I think one of the problems again then is is that from the Chinese side, the the uh, the suspicion towards the United States mainly uh, is so deep. Uh, and and, and it's, you can't really overstate that, uh, that, that they really feel that, that the United States is, and together with the allies, are, are trying to, to hold back China and to, to contain China, as they claim. But also, it's in many ways directed towards the, the regime, to the World Communist Party. That the, I mean, the, the, Pompeo, for example, said that obviously the, the Communist Party is a problem, and, and, and Xi Jinping so. So they feel that, that uh, I mean, <laughs> It's very difficult during that, under that kind of uh, situation, to, to expect them to to actually negotiate any deal. So, I mean, I, to me, it's it's very clear that the only path for the Chinese side is to become stronger and and to improve their their position in terms of negotiation and to to uh, to uh, negotiate from from an even stronger position. So, like I was saying previously, they they think that the time is on their side. Uh, and also, I, I think uh, diplomacy is, I mean, politics is becoming so much dominating in China now that, that I mean, they, there's a lot of talk about the foreign ministries being, you know, sidelined in a way, and it's, it, it's, it's becoming much more ideological. So even though there might be a lot of voices within the Chinese diplomacy uh, uh, establishment that, that have solutions and ideas and have connections, they're not getting, um, uh, uh, they're not getting that kind of influence. So, I mean, you have the examples of this war, warrior diplomats, for example, that, that has there's been a lot of talk about that around the world that are really, you know, just destroying China's relationship with other countries. But it, domestically, it, it, it's popular and, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it carries a strong message. 
So I'm unfortunately I'm, I'm really I'm really pessimistic when it comes to these kind of uh, uh, you know deals being made in the current environment, uh, and I'm which is tragic. I'm usually very optimistic when it comes to politics, but but now the current situation in China is it, I'm I'm struggling to find um, find positive development paths. And just one example when it comes to to the Indian and China relationship, which I, see, I think is very telling, is the case when uh, now India was actually going to attend the the Winter Olympics in in, in China, but then then they the Chinese decided to to let one of the uh, officers we, actually the officer was that was in charge of of, um, of of the Chinese side in the conflict with uh, at Galwan to be one of the torchbearers uh, for for the Olympics, which obviously was very good idea domestically because it you know. I mean, it, it strengthened this narrative of, of, of China, but it was completely tone deaf when it comes to relations to India. Of course, Indians would be extremely angry. And the result was that India decided to, to diplomatic boycott, which is in the end was negative for China, of course. Uh, so these kind of calculations, you wonder how do they calculate and how do they think? It, 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 I think it's obvious that, that in these cases, diplomats with, with a skill uh, are not, they don't, their voices are not heard. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I, one question, I would like to pick up on something that you mentioned earlier, Oscar, and then ask this to Shruti. Um, this, um, this idea that uh, uh, Foreign Minister Mangi's visit was also about perhaps driving a wedge between India and sort of the West, Western powers. Um, I mean, uh, uh, what, what is your sort of view on 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 this? Is it is it something? Uh, I mean, how has has this situation that is unfolding with the invasion um, uh, of Ukraine and also um, you know Russians Russian overtures to India um, at the moment with with with, with the selling um, oil at a reduced price and so forth, and also Lavrov's recent visit. Um, is this putting India in an uncomfortable position, you think, or how, how, how is it dealing with this situation that is occurring at the, at, at the very uh, present? Uh, thanks, Henrik. I think Oscar, uh, you know, said it very well uh, when he sp spoke of the example of the Beijing Olympics and, you know, the, giving the torchbearer, uh, the person who was at the forefront of the Galvan Valley clash, the PLA soldier. I mean, what was the messaging that China was trying to achieve. Uh, and it goes back, or in fact, Wang Yi before coming here talk, talking about Kashmir at the UIC when that's certainly a red line for India. Uh, you know, what is, what is the larger messaging in play? But I think if you go back to the drawing board and if you see what the Chinese have been saying uh, in their writing, uh, especially on India, it's, you know, it, there are four or five lines of thought. One is of course this, you know, there's this constant issue of, uh, a lot of hatred on hatred might be a strong word, but the fact that there's a very there is an in, uh, visceral dislike for parity with India. So the fact that you know India even is considers itself in the same space as China is undeserving. So I think that translates a lot into the way they look at the relationship. So you know you, you we all look at global times, and you know it's not the gauge for you to gauge India-China relations, but the fact of the provocation constantly that comes in all of their editorials or the op-eds that they put across is India as an American stooge, India falling into, um, you know, the US-led trap and bandwagoning, especially in the Indo-Pacific theater and making, not having the ability to contribute to the Indo-Pacific order, but, you know, uh, trying to launch itself uh, on the shoulders of the United States. This is sort of the, uh, the narrative that constantly repeat, repeats itself. So, but what we saw during the Ukraine crisis was a quick shift. I tracked the editorials, especially coming out of the Chinese state media, and suddenly you see this nuance that India finally exercises its strategic autonomy, realizes that China and Russia are its true friends and therefore it has, when India has made none of these statements. And let me just, you know, even though I'm not the expert in the issue, I think if you look at how India's position has evolved 
on the crisis it's it's made very clear in all its statements that you know the way india has voted does not or especially uh, in the united nations does not reflect any alignment in its position vis-a-vis -vis china and i think this sort of demarcation india has made up in a lot of the uh, political statements that it has put out and the way it has you know walked the diplomatic uh, tight rope on the Ukraine crisis. Now, of course, the larger questions of Russia, India's dependency on Russia, uh, spare parts, all of that does come into blur the picture. But I think Wang Yi visit, what it was trying to do was, you know, piece the narrative together that India has been isolated from the West. And therefore, we are going to find new alignments in play now that India has made understood its folly. So I think what in the Indian foreign minister now if you see, he's on, on a tour in South Asia. He's gone to Sri Lanka, etc. apart from making his own statement. So I think India is quite resolute in the way it's handled its crisis. It's trying to carve out a space for itself. And if you see all the statements, even by the Quad partners uh, on India's evolving position, I think it's been fairly empathetic. Uh, and they're saying that, you know, we are the partners of choice for India. And we are going to make that happen by facilitating whatever India needs to get itself out of these dependencies. So uh, I think India has walked the diplomatic tightrope to the best of its ability and the situation is evolving and India's position will evolve to reflect that. Thank you. Um, we don't have that many more questions from the audience. So uh, before we round up, I would just like to ask you one more question, uh, Shruti, if you allow me. Um, that is, um, you know, sometimes you hear um, um, about, India's position now uh, with, with the invasion of um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that where were, I'll bring Europe into this and the EU. So where were the Europeans in condemning the Chinese, uh, you know, troop buildup uh, around Doklam uh, and uh, elsewhere around the border areas? Um, where, where, ha where has the Europeans been and where, wh why are they not, you know, um, making stronger statements about these issues. Um, so why should we now when this happens in Ukraine? So what, how, how deep is that sentiment you think? Um, you know, sort of, um, um, how should I put it? Um, um, a reluctance uh, uh, from the Europeans to, to come out strongly for, on the, for the Indians. Uh, and, and how deep is that felt, you think, in India? Uh, and how does that me, reflect on the current? That's situation? right. Let me just nuance this by saying that, you know, of course, we all have a very active strategic community, both across the uh, pond and in New Delhi, and there are a lot of sentiments and so on and so forth. But it's important to understand that people who are actually doing the job uh, in, all, uh, in all capitals that we're talking about, I think have had a fairly empathetic view of India's position. And I, I also think that, you know, when Doklam happened or perhaps Galwan happened, there is also a possibility that India has always said that the India-China relationship is a bilateral relationship. And, you know, that's how India is, India is capable enough of handling its own battles. So, uh, you know, there does, I'm not sure how, how much of, uh, how many times India has actually sought that support uh, from say the EU or elsewhere to, uh, for, to condemn Chinese action. So I'm not sure about that. Let me just put it that way. Uh, yes, a lot of the popular sort of sentiment uh, is, you know, is, is, is feeling that India is suddenly been isolated in this conversation. Uh, however, we've had a lot of experts coming out and saying that's not the case. India has steadily, surely, uh, and maybe slowly carved out a diplomatic space for itself with this evolving position. We've had a lot of visits so far. Uh, they've lot, they've, a lot of offers, especially from the United States, have come in about how to you know, supplement India's needs for spare parts and so on and so forth, joint development in R&D. The EU, of course, remains a fundamental partner, and I think the foreign minister said that at the Munich Security Conference in terms of the economic heft and expertise that it brings in, uh, which is imperative for India to realize its Indo-Pacific vision. So, uh, yes, the you know the occasional turbulence remains, and unless uh, the political sort of will and investment that both sides, both EU and India, have put into the relationship, suddenly dissipates because. 
and Ukraine becomes that wedge, which I don't think is happening because we've seen a lot of high profile visits, uh, you know, in India from the EU as well. Um, I don't think that, you know, we are on that much shaky ground as it were. Uh, I think a lot of it, this is perception and propaganda battles, which um, will continue. We see that in all, you know, every time there's a foreign policy crisis, you see that play out. Uh, but I don't see long-term sort of damaging impact at the moment. With that, um, I would like uh, to thank uh, you all, um, all the panelists for a very rich and insightful comments and um, also the audience for your questions. Um, and I would also like to thank the team uh, at UI for setting this up. Um, Linda and Ilva especially and um, uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning this uh, this webinar will be edited in some form and then put uh, placed on the UI uh, website and so you can return to it for for the specifics and details and uh, thank you so much uh, everyone for joining thank you the panelists and I hope to, to see you all soon again thank you